This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are with Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey. So tell me, muse of that plant of many resources, which wandered far and wide, the ancient plant of food, fuel, and fiber, cultivated for millennia. Historically, dietary use of the raw cannabis plant brings us in line with 34 million years of cannabis evolution. So, while we are looking at all of this nonsense that has come up, if we but take a look back and see the phenomenal use of this plant and hundreds of millions of years ago. And so our odyssey begins. As we venture through these past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant for which cannabis derives. The many uses of the plant, hemp, cannabis, hashes, cannabis and religion, cannabis and medicine, cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam. As you know, the cannabis industry in Hawaii is growing by leaps and bounds. In 2015, a dispensary program was established with eight licenses awarded on four islands. The dispensaries are vertically integrated, whatever that means. They will produce and distribute all of their own medical cannabis products. In 2018, with, we will have a reciprocity with other state license holders, and they will be allowed to, if they're on vacation, to go to the dispensary and get what they need. Now, but the Department of Health issues about 1,200 medical cannabis cards each month, and that number is growing. Hawaii's cannabis industry is facing more setbacks as the state struggles with an understaffed program. Seven of 11 positions are vacant at the Department of Health, which oversees medical cannabis patients' registry and dispensary licensing program. The registry is down to three of six people, three of six, while the dispensary program has four vacancies out of five. But what is there to say? What, what, what can I say? So, uh, no, no, without going into a diatribe about cannabis and Uncle Sam and the state and whatever. So I have asked our dear friend, and who really stepped out of his program and came over to visit with us, Paul Klink. And for our audience, you might remember that we talked to Paul while he was in Houston. He volunteered to go to Houston in the flood, and in spite of his own medical issues, went to help the other people. So welcome back, Paul. It oh. is a pleasure to see you live. Yes. <laughs> it is. Well, thank you for having me on your show. And it is just such a pleasure. Paul has been with the Cannabis Project program as a patient as well as a caregiver. Yes. And so talk to us. Tell us all. How did you get started in the Cannabis Project? I got started learning about medicine and the use of non-synthetic, healthy, all-natural solutions for medications I was given at a young age that I knew were causing more side effects than they were mitigating the symptoms or the ailments they were supposed to. And so immediately my, my sights landed on cannabis. Um, in my case, with cardiac, pulmonary, um, cancer, a, a few different qualifying diagnoses, <gasps> Uh -huh. um, I learned that with chemotherapy, with uh, the heart medicines, the blood pressure medicines, the dietary issues, I was in a lot of trouble with traditional synthetic man-made chemical-based non-natural solutions, most of which would be the opiates. At one time I was on, coincidentally, 420 different oh. psychotropic pills a month that oh were my. prescribed. Oh so my. 240 oxycodones, 90 morphine, 15 ERs, 90 Xanax. And on and on. Who would who, did, who would prescribe that much? Our pain, our pain clinic. When once you, the regular doctors have written you off for their ability to mitigate your pain symptoms, 
One of your rights as a patient is not to experience pain, so they hand you to what's usually called a pain clinic at one of the big hospital chains or HMOs, and then from there they do whatever they can off formulary without looking at the books and try to get you to whatever you need to get to get rid of your pain, and that's what it took to start scratching the surface of my pain. I have countless heart implants. I have pulmonary issues that make it difficult to breathe. I have severe pain in a couple areas of my body from ailments and accidents. So what I found was I could, for me, replace all the opiates over time. It took me a few years to get this accomplished to where now I, I use re cannabis as my exclusive pain relief when I need it. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it saved my life. 20 people die every, or one person dies every 20 minutes from an opiate overdose is what I've read. But at least 20,000 people die a year from opiates. Um, no one in the history of man has ever overdosed from cannabis. And if you could have, I probably would have by now. So <laughs> I, I can tell you that that's, that's the case. Um, in Hawaii right now, having the openings at the Department of Health that need to be filled are not as easy as it sounds. I offered to go and volunteer. I'm already a volunteer for the state of Hawaii Department of Health Medical Reserve Corps, which is an army of people like myself in the medical industry that want to volunteer for the state for emergencies. And at this point, I believe this is an emergency, it and is. I think they should activate MRC or allow volunteers because the state's process to hiring people, which is in its fashion because of needs, I get it, but they start off with civil service. So the process to being hired is, is insanely long and arduous, and even though some positions may be exempt from this process, it's still obviously taking months and months, whereas a few months ago, they were pretty fully staffed and cards were arriving for all patients in about seven to 10 days, and now it's going on just in, interminably. But they are triaging the application. So my cancer patients get their card within a week. Same well, with hospice. But, okay, it's uh, thirty-eight fifty. is that the price for the... $38.50 fee. Okay, so if you're and doing... $35 plus $3.50 yeah. fee. So if you're doing uh, 1200 a month, mm -hmm. isn't that enough to pay? I don't think budgetary issues are the issue. I think it's the, their systems and procedures for hiring people, and there's going to be some apprehension in the state. If I have a cushy job at the state, working hard and earning my living and doing everything I'm supposed to do, and I'm working okay, which I'll assume most employees are, why would they switch? Because they have to offer it to internal staff first, and there's a period of time it must remain like that. Again, there's a process people don't understand, so they, they jump to, why aren't they hiring people? Right. Well, there's a process. Now, if I am already working at the state, and that's a long part of the process, is hiring people within, why would I switch to the medical cannabis registry when reasonably to believe in the next few years it'll be recreational and that office won't exist anymore? So it's a very temporary assignment in that sense if we go the same route as every other state that's being medical mm -hmm. and shifting to recreational. So I, I understand the apprehension for existing state employees for moving over to the registry, but there's people outside like Ooh, myself. Yeah. Well, recently one of the officials said he came back from the mainland for a tour and he was jokingly saying he was offering positions, saying we need to hire people in Hawaii. I, I took a little bit of an offense to that because I'm here and I want to work. I would love to have that position as an employee or as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. It'd be a great opportunity to help that many more patients on a daily basis. And I'm sure, and I know the people working there, and I know them well. They really have our best interest at heart, and they're working as hard and fast as they can. I mean, they have to have some part of a life outside the office, but I believe they're working a lot of overtime right now to do as fast as they can, but they're way understaffed. Well that the health department got dinged, as lack of a better word, yeah. for they failed about their uh, compliance with taking care of nursing homes, hospital complaints, and things like that. Yeah. They had nine employees, nine employees, and they've got hospitals and nursing homes on every island and I was at a workshop, and I asked the gentleman that's in charge, same one that's head of the cannabis project, mm -hmm. why don't you hire people on each island? Why do all nine inspectors live on Oahu? So if they're going to inspect the big island, that's $300 a day. You can pay somebody that lives there. Yeah. Uh, there was no... No yeah, comment. It, there's usually no comment to questions like that because there's so much going on behind the scenes. It, by definition, it's a political situation with appointees and working under a government and in the state of Hawaii. Right. Thank God in the cannabis division, they're way beyond employees. They're very compassionate individuals who are there now. I know and have been there, and I know them personally. They're amazing people, and they're doing the best they can with what they have. 
the, the scariest thing to me is that we have patients out here dying waiting for their medicine that are following the law under yes. a microscope to not touch the medicine until they have their card and now they cannot get their cards in a timely fashion. I just recently, I have a handicap placard for my car and you have to do renewals through the mail. So I mailed in my application. I got my placard back in four days in the mail. Yes. Four days. Yes. In four days, mm -hmm. I have my placard back. So someone got my application, keyed it in, got it in the computer, verified it, did the printing, did the letter shop, did the mail services, and got it to me in four days for a placard. That's not going to save or, or lose my life. A medical cannabis card, if my same medical cannabis card could take multiples and multiples of those numbers of days. And again, depending on my condition, but people who are in pain, they'll be triaged to the lower part of the list because cancer patients and hospice patients are being triaged to the top of the list, getting their cards the quickest. But I'd venture to say that most people who are in severe chronic pain that qualifies for the card are in just as much of an urgency to get it as those triage patients. So it's, it, it's supposed to be a tough decision to decide who gets their card first because they all need it desperately and cannot get their medicine without it. So what, do we, what can we do to, to assist? There, there must be something we can do. Yeah, I, I really believe it all starts off with your elected officials. It's your vote, right. your, whether you voted or not, and everyone should please vote, register and vote. Um, but more importantly, if you're a citizen of the state of Hawaii, find out who your representative and senator are and send them emails immediately. If you want to know who they are, uh, oh, there's no. resources yes. like the Hawaii Cannabis um, Expo, and, and there's also the Hawaii Dispensary Alliance, or get a hold of us at Honolulu Wellness Center, and we'll definitely give you the contact information. So, we, because there has to be, and we, we can't put pressure on them. I yeah. mean, you know. So, there has to be a way to streamline that process. You know what, Marsha? This has been a bugaboo or a pet peeve of mine for quite a while now, because originally back in 2000, the program was such that you'd apply, the application was sent through the doctor, the card came back to the doctor, and the doctor delivered it to you, or the doctor's office, a clinic, a center right. like mine. Why they have a process right now where the only thing the state is doing when I, send in, when I click the button to send the application to the state for processing, all they're doing is verifying the ID and the spelling of the name, that the address for the growth site, if there is one, is a, a, applicable for a growth site. Some people mistakenly put a P.O. box. You can't grow too many right. plants in a P.O. box. So they're checking on that, which all can be automated. And then that's all they do. Then they send it to a printer, then to a letter shop, and then to mail services, and then to the post office during the holidays to get this very, very critical piece of documentation. Well, does it go to, to you? Does no, it, go it goes straight to, to the, the patient, doctor. Straight to the patient. Oh, to the so patient, that's what I meant. Instead of talking about reciprocity, instead of talking about all the situation with the Department of Health, what I propose and have asked more than once now from the Department of Health is that they streamline it. Yes. All we have to do, these are eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper with the card printed in them that are perforated. You can peel it right off. Just give us those documentations and access to the database. Right now, the dispensaries all have access to the database. The laboratories have access to the, access to the database. There's no reason why the doctor's staff in the clinic shouldn't have access. So for that reason, I think we should streamline it and the clinics hand the card to the patient the same day they come in for their appointment. Why? But the card goes to the patient, not to... Right now, it gets mailed directly to the patient. Well, that's even better. The best way is just for us to hand the card to the patient the same day. So whether they're a tourist or whether they're a local, because we can't treat tourists differently or more right. nicely than locals, of course. So they have to have a qualifying diagnosis. They come to us. We vet their medical records they bring with them or send to us in advance, same as a local, and we can go to international certifying boards to make sure those doctors are certified, verify they're exactly like a local patient, but instead of us hitting submit to the state, we just hit print, and it prints, and we hand it out, we hand it over. As a pastor, I can marry people. Right. As, as a notary, I could, I could sign things worth billions of dollars. As a representative and a volunteer of Medical Reserve Corps, I facilitate and help thousands of kids to get immunized shots in their arm, our children. Right. Why can't I hand someone a card? It just doesn't make sense. So if we could streamline it to where we're handing the card to the patient the same day, they can go straight to the dispensary, because the dispensaries can't do that. It's a conflict, oh. and get their medicine right away. Well, we need to take a break, and we will be back in one minute and talk to Paul Klink, who has been so gracious to show up oh, today. I love you guys. Marcia, you're the best. I'm here for you. We'll, we'll see you in one minute.
This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You may say I'm a dreamer. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show is dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella. And we are back with my dear friend, uh, Paul Clank from the Honolulu Wellness Center. And we're talking about, my favorite subject, of course, is cannabis. And there's so much to learn. As we said, this is a 10,000 year odyssey. There's so much to learn. Tell us now this, uh, can you see this cannabis? Well, there will be a uh, cannabis expo in February, right? So tell us about that. Uh, yes, yeah, some amazing local talent have put together this expo. We are, we are in our third year. I can say we because I've been a sponsor since the first year, uh, one of the lower level sponsors, but a, a sponsor not all the same, and definitely an integral part of their team because they're very patient-centric. They're very concerned about making sure the patients who need the medicine can get it and make sure we appreciate all the freedoms the Cole Memorandum gives us. The federal government, Department of Justice, has produced a document that's renewed every year that allows states to have medical cannabis programs or cannabis programs and as long as the citizens of that state follow the rules of that state the federal government has documented they will not prioritize or fund the prosecution of any patients so it gives us the freedoms to have this industry right um, in that same light the expo brings together people i call the lifestyle people the people who maybe do it more for anxiety stress insomnia um, without a medical card say and just are self-medicating um, a lot of people with anxiety who we hope we get to uh, help to get approved in the future. Um, actually, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, yes. was approved Look, yesterday. Yes. Um, but general anxiety wasn't, unfortunately. They just need more information. Um, but at the expo, it brings together the lifestyle and, and, for me, more importantly, the medical side of the industry. All of the clinics like mine work together. Again, for me, I don't compete with anybody. I collaborate with everybody. When I was in Texas helping out after Hurricane Harvey, I forwarded my phones to what they would consider my competitors. And they're like, you're what? I said, well, we got to take care of the patients. Right. And they did a great job with my patients that I sent over. I checked with each one of them. But we all work together. It's very collaborative, not really competitive. So an expo like this is a lot of fun of learning new technologies. People don't have to smoke the cannabis anymore. Putting ash and smoke in your lungs, I don't feel is a good idea. And as a medical professional, I'll never allow my patients to do that. So we help people learn how to make yeah. tinctures, salves, DMSO rubs, and vapors. And the and vapor technologies just exploded. It's amazing. And it's especially children. With keiki, we do almost exclusively edibles. If they, okay. Some children might have an issue with being NPO or not being able to put something through their mouths, and then we can do suppositories, or we also do DMSO rubs, rubs yes. so the medicine goes into your blood system through your skin, mm -hmm. um, especially some cancer patients who can no longer ingest things through their mouth. Um, and this usually brings them back to the point where they can't eat again, and they get hungry, and they're happy, because the one side effect we all get from this medicine is giggles. And so, oh, how nice. I, I, it's amazing when you go into a hospice and you're helping people with cards uh, with their medicine and their self-professed curmudgeons on their deathbeds and within a half an hour they're sitting up telling you jokes they heard 30, 40 years ago and giggling like little kids. And many of these people actually end up leaving hospice. They get to go home because the medicine gets them to the point where they don't, they're not palliative care anymore. And that's happened quite a few times. It's a beautiful thing to see. So instead of... My daughter, for instance, is a hospice nurse. And so if the patient is struggling, she calls the doctor and he says, give her morphine. Yeah. And then she says, well, that's not helping. Well, give her more. Yeah. And pretty soon 
it's terminal sedation and the patient's gone. Yes. So she is the reason that I'm even learning about this oh, because she you. said, Mom, if they did this, we wouldn't have to do more things. Exactly. I saw a patient this morning who's stage four, end stage cancer, a lung cancer, hospice bound, horrible cachexia, which is wasting syndrome. He's wasted into a skeleton with stretched skin over it. So right. It's a sin, it's a shame. And he hasn't had his taste buds or a hunger pain in, in months since he started the most recent chemo. And he got his card, and I gave him some tincture and put it under his gums. And his assistant called me and just told me that he just ordered a big lunch. Yep, great. This is a miracle. So he's got to pace himself because he hasn't eaten much lately. Yep. But the good news is that he'll get more energy into his body to try to get through chemotherapy, which is necrosis and that very is, dangerous to the body. Stuff. Whereas cannabis creates an environment of apoptosis, which is much more healthy. And in my experience of everything I've seen, and I'm not making a claim, is that I've seen many, many times people have taken the cannabis medicine and pulled themselves out of hospice, pulled themselves out of the deepest despair. And, and like I said, the worst side effect is going to be giggles. And so they get their appetite back, they get their energy back, their body becomes more unfriendly. So I've heard to cancer and it's seen with my own eyes many times. But legally, you got to be very careful because the regular doctors who don't want to participate in cannabis will quickly pounce on anyone making claims that aren't FDA approved. But the FDA is not God and it's not all mankind because the rest of history and the majority of humans will say clearly that cannabis has very many medical benefits. Well, uh, and just for our audience, anyone that's paying attention has heard me say this. Aspirin is not approved by the FDA. I did not know that. Yeah. So <laughs> we're, we're in good company. Great, great <laughs> we're in company. good company. Yeah, and actually cannabis is much safer than yeah. aspirin for the And aspirin was created... Oh. by the bark of a tree. So just like oh, cannabis wow. is, is one I'm, of those... I'm embarrassed I don't know that, but I'm glad I do it, now. Thank it, you. This is one that. of God's gifts to us because... It saved my life. But it's been there for thousands of years, and you don't... You can just plant... It's a weed. You plant it anywhere, and it grows, yep. and it harvests three times a year. At least. So you... It is a gift. You know, there's... And there's an, the reason I brought this... There's a great article in here about uh, Satchmo, and everybody knows who that is. Amen. And he attributes this, his ability to do what he did to cannabis. Wow, that's beautiful. To, to have the lungs to, yeah. to day after day oh, after day. And he was an artist. The guy was just a, a, a legend, a myth, and a, amazing, yeah. my gosh. But it helps me breathe, it helps my heart relax, helps my blood pressure stay down. It mitigates almost most of my pain. Um, and there's different ways of doing cannabis now. So before, there's, people would just roll it into a joint or put it in a bowl and smoke it or in a bong, which has never been in a, a recommended way of doing it for patients, especially patients with lung cancer. Right. Um, so I very quickly learned about vaporizing the actual bud itself. So there's devices you can buy now where you put the actual flower into the device and it's got a ceramic or quartz kiln in the device safely, it heats it to pre-combustion temperatures where it vaporizes the medicine, the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the medicines of the plant, and you just inhale that at a lower temperature because there's no fire. And it fits in your hand. And so you don't need to do anything to the medicine. You just put it in this device. When you're done, you can even cook with it or do other things with the leftover because it's not vacant of medicine, but it's a much more efficient way of doing the medicine. When you're smoking it, it's been said that you lose about 75% of the value of the, the flower. Vaporizing, it keeps about 97% of the ben medical benefit going to you from the flower. It's also very easy to teach people how to make their own tinctures to put under their tongue or drink with their tea. It's very easy to teach people how to make a DMSO, uh, a salve you can put on your skin and get the medicine to your skin or into a certain area like for sciatica or other diagnoses where there's, it's locational. Um, but there's very interesting ways of teaching people how to do that once they get their cars and they can get the medicine and make it legally. And they can grow it themselves. Anybody can grow up to 10 plants for each one of the medical cards. Yo. So that's very helpful. Now, if I get my card and everything checks out and they yeah. tell me I can get, grow 10 plants. Yep. Okay, now what? What am I gonna do? Where do I get a plant? What do I have to do? How do I do the soil? Uh, can I do it inside? Can I do it outside? If I live in the condominium? 
What are the rules? What are, what are the rules? The rules you know, are this really is, spelled out clearly this, at the state this. website and also on our website. If you go to HonoluluWellnessCenter.com, because growing is not as easy as it sounds. No. Getting the plants and getting the seeds is it could be a challenge. I, we usually recommend people go to a website, Seedsman, S-E-E-D-S-M-A-N, and there's a link from our website for that. But one thing that growing teaches people is they don't want to grow. <laughs> it's really a pain in the yeah, butt. Yeah, I know with and my so, own yard and it's like <laughs> well, once you have of... your card you can get into the dispensary and the dispensaries are amazing there's two open now aloha green and noah botanicals they both have amazing staff they have great knowledge bases and something we do for our patients and i actually do for other doctors and clinics patients i'm happy to go with the patient into the dispensary the first time or whenever they need me because i also have a card and i can enter and that's been really useful for the patients to meet the people at the dispensary i introduce them around i show them the different options that are available some things that are coming up soon and get them acclimated to going to a dispensary. They're very comfortable, very convenient, lots of parking. Um, there's waiting areas in both, and so there's a very comfort. But once you go there the first time, it could be unnerving. So being there with someone you know could be helpful. Well, now, can anybody go to the dispensary? As long as they have a card. You have to have yeah, your medical have card, have card and an ID. People can come and wait in the lobby, but they can't come in where the medicine is without a card. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I escort someone, if you're a caretaker for someone, when but, someone gets a medical card, they can ask to add on a caretaker, then you and the patient would be allowed in. If they're having ambulatory issues where they can't get around on their right. own, in that case, we can get them to the door, but they would have to have someone with a card to get them past the door into the dispensary, the way the law is written right now. But there's always going to be someone there who will help. It's never been an issue that I'm aware of at all. And I, well, I go with my patients many, much of the time, and I don't charge extra for that. I, just, I, would, I treat people the way I want to be treated, and I remember how freaky it was going the first time and it would have been nice if my doctor offered to come with me I probably wouldn't have believed him and so I actually meet my patients at and the dispensaries are very close to one another so I we meet in the parking lot or at one of the lobbies and I go with them into the dispensaries and introduce them to the security and the, the staff and the dispensary and the medicine and the ways to take it and give them a good idea of how they're gonna use their medicine then we give them all their information all our patients write their own notes and so they can learn about titration and dosing how often, how much, how should I do it, which variety should I do, for which symptoms, and get the varieties you need and hybrid them together and put them in the device and inhale the vapor or make your medicine. Hmm. So it's pretty simple when you're with someone who's already done it, that. which yeah. is we walk you through the whole process. And we, we actually see patients for the price for one appointment, which is lower than anybody's, we include two more appointments during the year mm -hmm. to do follow-up because we want it to be an ongoing Great. doctor and clinic patient relationship. Great. So, again... Thank you, Paul. This is Paul Klink from Honolulu Wellness Center. And Marcia, and thank you. And your website address? HonoluluWellnessCenter.com. Or if you're lazy like me, we got a shorter version, the number four, and then H for Honolulu, W for Wellness, C for Center.com. So 4HWC.com. Very good. Well, again, thank you so much. That's my blessing. And you will come back. Anytime you call, I'll be here for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Aloha, and we'll see you next time.